Welcome to this tutorial about multidimensional uh, linked data exploration with GLUE. Uh, so my name is Tom Robitaille. I'm a scientific software developer uh, based in the UK. Uh, I'm also the lead developer of GLUE. Um, so, right. So just what, what I want to do here is I actually just want to give uh, some, like a very, just a few slides, uh, which will give you an overview, so, so that if you're not familiar with uh, what Glue does, so you get just a sense of you know why we built it um, and what you can do with it. Um, and then we're going to dive right in and, and try and you know go through uh, some example data sets um, and analysis. Okay, so uh, Glue is a multi uh, multidisciplinary Python package for linked and multidimensional data exploration. So um, I'm going to explain a little bit more about each of these terms, but uh, so the multidisciplinary is very important. Uh, originally, we started off uh, building it for astronomy, but we've actually now made it uh, generic so that it can actually be used uh, for any field of science. Um, and as I'll explain in a minute, we have plugins uh, which kind of help, uh, basically help you use it for different disciplines. Um, and then uh, I'll mention a little bit about the the linked and multidimensional uh, data exploration. So uh, the the fundamental thing about data is that a lot of the time it can be highly dimensional. And I'm not just talking about when you have, you know, cubes and images and, and so on, uh, but more the concept that if you have a table uh, with 100 columns in it, that's a 100 dimensional data set. Um, but it's not just that. The thing about data is that it can be heterogeneous. So it's very rare, in my experience, that with a real life problem, you just have one data file which you know, has everything that you need. In some cases, you, know, you do spend the time building one data file that, ha that has everything. In other cases, it's just impossible because you have images, you have uh, data cubes, you have catalogs of some kind, and you want to bring all these together um, and visualize them at the same time. Um, also importantly, those files you know might be uh, have different conventions in terms of you know different units, uh, just different coordinate systems and so on uh, in the files. And so uh, the idea is we need to be able to deal with this kind of diversity of data uh, without actually requiring that people go through beforehand and clean up all the data extensively. Uh, sometimes you just want to do something quickly and use the data as it is. Um, finally, one of the key uh, things about Glue is that we're interested in uh, finding a subset of the data. So we're not, we're not necessarily interested in, in the data as a whole. We want to find interesting subsets in the data uh, that we can draw conclusions about. So um, Glue basically allows us to, to do all this. Um, and when we talk about the linking of, of uh, the, the kind of linked data exploration, uh, there's two aspects. One is that you can, if you just have one data file um, and you make different visualizations of this data file, you want those to be linked so that if you then start to make selections in one, you see those uh, in other ones. So, so, so that's something that uh, you know, you've probably seen in a lot of other tools as well, uh, the concept of brushing and linking, where you select things and then see them in, in another um, dimension, essentially. But the other thing is we want to link across data sets. So we want to set up links between data sets, make selections in data sets, and then see those selections appear in other data. All right. So. Um, Glue is, is uh, I refer to it interchangeably as a package, as an application, a library, and so on. It's, it's Python, uh, and you can import it as a Python package. The main way to use Glue is, uh, has been in the past through uh, a desktop application, uh, which is built using Qt. Recently, we started working on a, uh, a Jupyter uh, front end uh, for Glue, but a lot of the code is actually shared between uh, the two uh, different front ends. So whether it's um, Qt or the Jupyter interface, a lot of the code behind the scenes is the same. All right, so uh, I'm going to show a very brief uh, demo just to explain so you actually see what, what Glue might look like uh, when it's in use. So yeah, so this is an example. Uh, let me just make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so this is an example. Uh, it doesn't matter if you can't you know, read all the labels. The important thing is uh, you have this environment. This is a desktop application um, where you have um, this kind of area. The main area of the window is where you're going to make different visualizations of your data. The, uh, the top left is kind of where you see what data is available and what selections you've made on the data. Um, and then the bottom left is used for all the kind of options to control uh, the appearance of the, the visualizations. So uh, this is an example. All right, this is an example where we have actually a number of data sets um, which have been linked together. Um, so uh, we have um, 
a bunch of images. And so this, this on the left here uh, is a kind of multicolor image. Uh, this is an astronomy data set, as you can probably tell. Um, and in astronomy, we love to make you know, pretty pictures uh, with basically images at different wavelengths. So that's, that's what's been done here. Uh, there's five different images that are contributing to this. Um, the data sets are not all on the same grid, so we've linked the data. Um, I'm just going to show you this window here, uh, which shows that essentially we have this concept of you know, taking the data and then linking certain attributes or properties of the data uh, to properties in, in other data sets. Um, and uh, you know, the plots on the right over here show uh, a, a catalog of stars, basically, that are in the same region. Um, and so what you can do is you can do things like make selections, um, you know, in one visualization and see those propagate to another visualization. Um, and what you'll notice is that currently uh, the one on the left doesn't seem to have done anything when I selected these objects here. Um, but we can actually, that's because actually that data set is not linked. So we can do things like, you know, take these two data sets and we can, um, the details of this are not, not super important, but um, just to give you a sense uh, of what we're doing here, we basically uh, can make a link and links don't have to be necessarily one to one. They can be, you know, in this case, we're going to link two parameters from the one data set with two parameters from another data set. These are the positions, uh, the, the coordinates of the objects. Um, so uh, we just, <coughs> Uh, latitude. There we go. So if I link the data sets, I can now do things like, you know, take the red uh, objects that were selected and then uh, show them on top of the image uh, over here. So let's see. Okay, there we go. So um, uh, let me just select a few objects. There's a lot of things selected right now. Um, so I'm just going to select some of the points, and then you can see the points basically on top of the image. So if I now go into the image and then make a selection, um, then I'm going to be selecting the points, and then also I'm going to be selecting the pixels in the image and so on. So the, there's this concept that you have you know, multiple views of the data. Uh, you have linking between the different views. You have linking between the data sets uh, and so on. Um, so that's the very kind of, uh, there's a lot more, of course, but that we'll go through in a minute, but this is just to give you a sense of uh, what we can do. All right. So um, the, actually, one of the important things about Glue is that it's, we've made it so it's easy to customize and extend. Um, so we, we want to make sure that, for example, you know, if you work in an area of science where you have data files in a certain format and you want to be able to read them into Glue, um, we've tried to make it as easy as possible uh, to do that. Um, and basically just making it so you can write simple Python functions. Uh, you don't have to understand how to build a desktop application. Uh, you can just write these simple plugins uh, for Glue. Um, and the plugins can actually then be distributed as packages if you want. Um, and so what that means is we're able to then, you know, have a plugins for different fields of science, for example. Um, you know, you can easily share the, the plugin with other people. So to give some examples of plugins, um, the Glue VisPy Viewers plugin is actually one that you should have by default. Um, it provides the, the 3D scatter plots and uh, volume renderings in Glue. Uh, there's a Glue medical plugin. Uh, it doesn't have a huge amount in it at the moment, but the idea is it, it makes it easier to read medical file formats. Um, uh, two other examples uh, are there's a Plotly um, exporter for, for Glue. So if you're using Glue and you make a plot that you like and you don't want to export it to a Plotly plot, uh, that's something you can do. I'll demonstrate it in a second. Um, and then just to give another example, you can also create custom visualizations in Glue. So if you don't, you know, you're not restricted to just scatter plots and histograms and images and so on, you can build any visualization you want uh, inside Glue. So I'll, I'll show an example which uses an application called Worldwide Telescope, which is you can think of it a little bit like a kind of planetarium uh, kind of software. So, um, right. Okay, so uh, this is an example of uh, a data set which um, is, I think it's all the earthquakes uh, that happened uh, in two 2010. Um, and you've probably s maybe seen data sets like this used for, for other tutorials too. Um, so this is uh, uh, these three kind of scatter plots here, uh, uh, the two scatter plots, sorry, and the histogram viewer are showing uh, the, 
the list of earthquakes. Um, and then what this is, is this is actually built using Worldwide Telescope. Um, it's, uh, it has basically a, a full kind of you know, rendering of the Earth. Uh, you can show, you can see the kind of objects that have been selected uh, appear in red in it. So I can make it them slightly bigger, as you can see. Okay, so you can see points like this one here. Um, and then as you, uh, let's uh, try to find some other ones. There's more over here. Uh, and so if you, you know, if you update selections, uh, so for example, if I select this, uh, all of, the, uh, let's see, maybe I'll make a selection over here. Oops. Okay, so then uh, the selection propagates to the other viewers uh, and then basically updates in all of them. Um, this is actually, uh, it's a pretty cool application, but what telescope you can actually, in, instead of showing things on the Earth, you can also uh, show, this is like a 3D view of the solar system. Um, so in this case, the, the earthquakes, it, have now, it now thinks the earthquakes should be shown in space, which is not correct. Uh, but that's, that's just because I selected the solar system. Uh, but it's, uh, so you can actually show you know, the Earth, you can show different planets, you can show the sky, and so on. Uh, but the, the main point of this is to show that we just built a little plug-in package to interface Worldwide Telescope and embed it inside a window here. Uh, and we're able to then you know, interact with the rest of GLUE and show selections. Um, the other one I wanted to show was, I think, um, yeah, so I haven't installed it in this uh, version here, uh, but I'll show you later if there's some time, which is the, the Plotly exporter. So if you have a plot like this, you can then uh, easily save uh, to Plotly uh, and see it um, in an HTML page. Okay, so um, that's just some examples of plugins. Um, there's more, there's a geospatial plugin, which provides support for reading in uh, basically geospatial uh, images, uh, satellite images. Um, and we also, so there's, there's other plugins I have mentioned here, but most importantly, we have a template package which you can use if you ever want to distribute your own plugins. Okay, but just to be clear, you can customize Glue without writing a whole package. You can literally just write five lines of code um, and start customizing it. Um, I should say at this point that you know we rely a lot on a lo uh, we rely on a lot of packages in the the scientific Python ecosystem, uh, and so we're really grateful for um, all those packages. Um, there's many more than that are, that are shown here. Okay, uh, Glue works on Python 2.7 uh, and uh, Python 3. Um, it also should work on Macs, Linux, and Windows. So uh, regardless of what laptops you have, it should work, um, and it's BSD licensed. We have um, a kind of a user community. We have a mailing list. Uh, we also have a Slack team uh, that you're welcome to join. Um, it's meant to be you know, for, for everyone, for users and so on. It's not just for, for developers. Um, and I've actually put a direct link here. You can also get to it for the documentation, but tinyurl.com slash glue hyphen help. Um, and that will have information on uh, the mailing list, the Slack team, and so on. Okay, finally, I'll just put this up, which has uh, the link to the website for Glue, so gluevis.org, um, and then uh, the main repository on GitHub. Um, so yeah, the gluevis.org website will give you a link to the documentation and so on if you want. Okay, so uh, at this point, we're ready to actually dive in. This was just to give you a little bit of a sense of uh, what Glue does. Um, but uh, basically, if you go to this page here, so tinyurl.com slash glue sci 2019, um, you'll find all the information that we need for, for today's tutorial. So, so this is the page. So just to, to give you a sense, um, over there is here. So there's the installation instructions uh, or updating instructions if you already have installed and want to update to the latest version. Um, there's a section called downloading the required data. Uh, so that basically uh, tells you how to, um, there's, a, there's a Git repository which contains all the data we're gonna use today. Um, you can also download a zip file if you prefer. If you downloaded the data last week, um, you might want to download it again. I've added some more example data files that could be useful. Uh, you don't need to do it right now. You can do it later in the tutorial if needed. Um, but just so you know, there were some data files added in the last few days. Um, Normally, I think that you sh a lot of you have already tried this. Uh, you can try and uh, open one of the data files in Glue just to make sure that uh, the installation works. Again, if you have any issues, just put the red sticker uh, on the back of the your laptop. 
Um, we're going to basically be looking at uh, the desktop application first and trying to load in some data into there, setting up some links, you know, creating different visualizations and so on. Um, then we'll, th these times are approximate, just to give you an idea of roughly what we're going to do. We're going to look into writing simple plugins uh, for Glue, so customizing some simple things. Um, we'll take a break in the middle. Uh, and then uh, what we'll do is after the break, we'll have some time where you can actually just, you're free to just explore, um, you know, your own data sets if you have some uh, with you in Glue. Uh, if you don't have any with you, then I've, got, I've put some example ones that you can try out. Um, but just so that you can kind of try and, you know, practice using it and seeing if you have any issues or questions. Um, and then at the end, we'll talk about the Jupyter interface uh, to, to Glue um, and uh, give that a try. Um, so, importantly, uh, I want you to, you know, interrupt me anytime, ask questions and so on. This is not meant to be, uh, you know, I, I don't want to just talk for four hours. Uh, so, so if you have any questions, uh, anything you want to ask, just, just ask at any point. Um, if you don't want to ask straight away in person or if you run into issues and you don't want to raise them straight away, there's a, a link to a Google Doc. So that Google Doc basically has... Um, that, that Google Doc has um, basically um, uh, is just a place where you can put questions uh, or if you run into any issues. Uh, if you have error messages that come up and so on, then you can paste them in here and we can take a look at them uh, later. Um, if we don't have, uh, yes, yeah, so the first question here, are there going to be any geospatial examples? Yes, there, there's an example uh, in, the, in the repo and I'll, I'll, um, I'll point you to that uh, soon. Um, so, but yes, feel free to ask questions through there if you prefer, you know, rather than raising your hand, either way. Um, if you miss anything, uh, commands, we, we do, we have actually made available like the, the kind of details, steps of everything we're gonna show. This is, so it's actually mostly notes for myself, but if you miss any commands that I show that, uh, then you can click on this link, uh, which will take you to a Google document that has all the steps we're following. All right, so uh, without further ado, what we'll do is uh, we will uh, load our first data set. So, and we'll, I'll take it very slowly at the beginning just to make sure uh, everyone um, is, is keeping up uh, in case you have any issues uh, from your installation. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna start off inside the glue example data um, folder. Um, and in there, is a, there's a, a directory called planes, okay? Um, and you can basically start up Glue um, with, let, let's start with just the smallest data set for now, which is uh, Boston Planes 6h.csv. If you open the 48 hour one, it's fine too. Um, but uh, let's just open the six hour one for now. Oh, that, that's a good start. So this was uh, definitely a deliberate uh, attempt to show you that if, glue, if the glue command doesn't work, um, then it means that you didn't activate your environment, probably, uh, if you're using Honda. So uh, the, the activate command is over here. Um, and you need to run it every time you open a new terminal or new tab uh, to have access to the environment. Okay, I'm just gonna check if I can make the resolution slightly lower. Okay, slightly better. Right, so if at any point, I'm gonna go through some steps, if at any point you have issues, glue doesn't open, the file doesn't open, whatever, just put a post-it note on your laptop. All right, so we have uh, this, this file. So just to explain what this is, um, we actually have a little kind of radio antenna uh, somewhere in Boston uh, that detects the uh, ADSB transmissions from planes. So basically each plane has a transponder which broadcasts uh, continuously its position, altitude, speed, uh, and so on. Um, and anyone can you know, basically use a little antenna, uh, detect those signals, um, and then transcribe them. So just for fun, we basically, we thought this would be a fun data set to use. Uh, 
Uh, we've recorded over about a year um, all the kind of planes that have transmitted signals around the Boston area. Um, and so the range is something like 50 miles or so. Um, so there's a lot of data points, but what we've done here is uh, just exported a subset of about six hours of that data. Um, so just to have a small data set to play around with initially. So the, the main window of GLUE here uh, is, as I said before, um, the top left shows you which data sets are loaded. Um, the main area over here shows you this is where we're going to build visualizations uh, using the data. Um, and then the bottom left is where we have options to control the, the, the visualizations. Um, there's a bunch of tools along the top that will explore some of those uh, in a second. So the, the first thing you can do is basically take the data set and drag and drop it onto uh, the main uh, canvas area here. When you do this, you have a little window that pops up and it asks you what kind of data viewer you want to, to, to use. Um, if you had extra plugins available, there would be more options here. Um, so you can say you want to make a scatter plot. Um, so by default, it'll just pick. It won't necessarily be smart about what it picks. It just picks the two first columns in the, in the table. So uh, two of the columns in the file are X and Y, which are the distance in, I think, kilometers uh, from Boston Airport. Uh, so let's make an XY plot. OK, this shows you all of the kind of individual transmissions uh, from planes, uh, basically in, in an XY plot uh, around Boston Airport. So the airport is around here. OK, so we're just going to zoom in a little bit. Uh, you can actually start to see there's actually tracks. Um, and some of, those, some of those tracks are actually because a lot of the planes follow the same trajectory uh, as they're landing or taking off. OK, so um, if you, of course, you know, we can do more than so. Actually, I should search, before I show any more viewers, I'm just going to show how the options work. So the, the options on the lower left here. Um, are basically options to do with the viewer as a whole. Okay, so when when I talk about a viewer, I'm talking about this little window here. Um, this here is the the viewer, um, and there's the viewer options and the the layer options. So layer options are options that relate to uh, a specific layer in the plot, which could be a one data set or one subset. Um, and then the general viewer options are things like what's on the x-axis and what's on the y-axis. I'm just going to switch back to, I just realized this is going to be slightly too low resolution. So, um, OK. So uh, yeah, over here, you have the, 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 the viewer options. Um, and uh, so as, as you saw just now, this is where you select uh, x and y. So let's say that you want to change you know, the color of the points or, or maybe color code the points by attributes or change the size of the points and so on. Um, this is what these options are here. So th those, these options are to do with the visual appearance of the plot. Um, so I can go to points, for example, um, and I can change uh, the size of uh, the points. Um, you can also uh, you know, change the color, for example, if you want. So you can color code the points. If you do um, color here and you go linear, then you can start to color code points by attributes. So you could color code points by, let's say, um, altitude. Uh, you can pick your color map. Okay, and then you start to see you know, the points uh, color coded by uh, altitude. Right. So any issues so far? Just to make sure, I just want to make sure all things aren't crashing or, and so on. OK, so um, let's switch back to uh, just having a single color. The reason why is because it can be useful in some cases to do this, uh, to color code points. But actually, if you're starting to make selections and so on, you're also going to be using color to indicate uh, certain kinds of selections. And so it gets a little bit confusing. So it's easier to keep it, uh, you know, one data set is one color uh, for this example. So if you take this data set, drag it onto the main canvas and make another uh, visualization. OK, so uh, here we can select, uh, for example, um, so heading on the x-axis. So heading being yeah, the direction in which the plane is going. 
so it's an angle between 0 and 360 degrees. Um, and then we can show altitude on the y-axis. This is kind of a fun data set because you, you, you start to see you know, interesting patterns like uh, you know, it seems like high altitude planes are mostly going in one direction, um, maybe, and maybe the opposite direction here, but mostly going in one direction. Um, and of course, there's a lot of planes that are pretty low because the, there's an airport in Boston, so um, those are all the planes uh, taking off and landing. Okay, so we have two visualizations of one data set. Uh, so the, we can actually start to make selections if we want. Uh, so uh, each individual viewer has a little toolbar, uh, which is shown here. Um, and that has selection tools. The selection tools are the tools that are in blue. So the tools on the left, these are ones that you might be familiar with uh, because they're basically the same as in Matplotlib. So you can, uh, there's a panning tool. Uh, there's a zoom tool, so you can zoom in you know, on different parts of the data, um, and the little house will take you back to the original view. Um, so the, the blue tools in general are ones that are related to selection. So for example, I can take this and, uh, so I, I've clicked on the blue rectangular tool, and then now I'm clicking and dragging on the main window here um, and selecting the points. Okay, so when you do this, you should see the selection, the, the points appear in the other uh, viewer here. So I should say, by the way, this is just a very small data set, just because I thought it'd be easier to start with this. Um, you can actually, there's, we, we actually provide the full data set over a year if you want to play with that later. Um, and there's actually a lot of interesting patterns you can see. Um, but you can already start to see that there's, uh, interestingly, you know, the high altitude planes uh, are going mostly in straight lines. Um, that's what you're seeing on the left here. So each, each plane is basically multiple points, which are separated by some amount of space. Um, not all messages are always received or detected, uh, and so there's gaps. Uh, and then there's you know, many planes over the six hours that transited, so that's why we get on these, these trails. Okay, so um, we can start to add more visualizations if we want. So let's click on the data set. Uh, and then drag it and make a, a histogram plot. Okay, and then uh, here we can select, for example, vertical rate, which will be will tell us, you know, whether the planes are taking off, landing, or just staying at the same altitude. Okay, so as for the scatter plot, there's a bunch of options uh, for the viewer in general. So you can say how many bins you know, should your histogram have. Um, and uh, so we can change this here, the bins to, for example, 30, um, just to see the, the patterns a little bit more. It's interesting because you can see you know, there's this kind of peak at zero, so that's on the planes that are staying at a constant altitude. Um, and then uh, there's kind of two, two peaks on, the, on either side. There's planes uh, that are going down and planes that are taking off. Actually, one interesting point about that is you can see that it's very asymmetric already. So planes that are going down are going down slowly, but planes that are going up are going up uh, sometimes faster than they go down. So, um, yep, so that's... Uh, that's the histogram viewer. Um, and then uh, if you want, you can play around with the 3D viewer. So uh, if you click again and drag onto the canvas, uh, you can make a 3D scatter plot. Okay. So um, for the scatter plot here, we can select. Uh, we can actually make it so it's like a real space scatter plot. It doesn't have to be, but so we can do X, uh, select X, Y, and altitude, and that gives us a kind of you know real space uh, view of the data. It's stretched vertically, um, but it's still um, you can kind of see the planes in 3D. Again, there's a variety of options for this specific viewer down here. Uh, you can play around with. So, for example, you can stretch uh, the view if you want a little bit, um, just to make more use of the, the available space. Okay. So, any issues so far? 
Any questions? Okay, so so far, you know, so good. We can make uh, different visualizations. We can uh, select a bunch of points in those. Now. You know, often you might want to go back and edit your selection. You want, might want to make multiple subsets or combine them uh, in some way. So the the key is if you want to basically um, modify a subset, you need to make sure that uh, in the top menu bar here, there's something where it says active subset. Um, you can basically select subset one. Another way of doing it is to make sure that subset one is selected over here. Okay, this, those two are equivalent. You can either, it depends what you find more convenient, you can either select the subset here, uh, or you can make sure it's selected in this drop down menu. So if I do this and I go to the histogram, for example, and uh, click on the blue uh, selection tool, then I can now select all the planes that are uh, going down. Um, presumably to land at the airport. Uh, and then we can go and, and take a look. So what's interesting about that is actually if you look in 3D here, you can see that uh, so the airport is around here. So a lot of the planes are going down are going down because they're close to the airport. Uh, but some of the ones that are going down are actually at high altitude. So it's probably because they're landing at some other airport. Uh, maybe they're going to New York or something. Um, and, but they're already starting to descend a little bit. Uh, but they're certainly way too high to be landing in Boston. Right. Feel free to you know play around with this. Uh, if you find any interesting things, you can also uh, yes. So can you export the rotation as a GIF? Can, can you do Can you export the 3D scatter as a GIF? Uh, yeah. So the question was, can you export this? Uh, yeah, the 3D scatter plot as a as a GIF. Um, I think you can. Um, so. Uh, the reason I say I think is because I think there might be an optional dependency that you might need to be able to do that. Um, but there's a, there's a button here that says start, stop the recording. So that might work. Um, and so you can click on the little record icon, do planes.gif. Um, I think it's working. So then I think you can basically move it around uh, and then stop the recording. Oh, so it worked. Uh, so let's see. Um, so there you go. So you have your exported uh, GIF from the plot. So it's always nice when things work with live demos. So. <laughs> okay, I was curious if you could run the rotate yeah. mode okay, and record at the same time. If you could have the rotate function going as you're recording. That's yeah, that's yeah. So, so there's a there's a button here which you can click, and it will basically continuously rotate the the plot. Uh, there's a small uh, issue in terms of UI at the moment that you can't do that and both and record at the same time, uh, but it's definitely so it's fixable. So yeah. Okay. Uh, but you can basically leave it, you know, rotating and then continue your exploration if you want. So you can go and you know update subsets, um, uh, and uh, that's weird. So um, so. Anyway, you can have it rotate around and have a look. Um, all right, so that's one subset, and I've shown you how you can modify the subset. Um, but the next thing is, what if you want to make multiple subsets? Um, so the, the, the way you do that is you make sure this is not selected, uh, or you change this up here to say none slash create new. Um, and once you've done that, then if you make a selection, uh, then you'll uh, that will make a new uh, subset. Yes. Is there a way to change the name of your subsets? Yes. So is there a, name to, a way to change the name? Uh, yes. You can double click on subsets and then you can change it. So for example, um, I could call this uh, interesting planes, and call this other interesting planes. Okay. So you can do that. Uh, you can all, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the question is uh, making uh, selections in a kind of more programmatic way, I guess. Yeah. Um, yes, there is. So we'll take a look at that in, in a second. Um, yeah, any other questions for now? Uh, so also, if you want to change the color of the subsets, uh, you can do that also by double clicking. So let's say you wanted to make it blue instead, um, then you can do that. OK, so that's making multiple subsets. If you want to go back and change the red one, for example, click on the red one uh, or select it up here uh, and then uh, select the, the, the points in the histogram or scatter plot or whatever. Um, I should also say, so one of the, the useful tools, selection tools, is this uh, this one here. In the it exists in the 2D and 3D scatter plots. It's a lasso selection. Um, the way that works is um, unlike the other selections, where you basically click, drag, and let go. Um, with this one, you have to basically you can draw the shape that you want, and once you're done, press enter. Okay, just in case you're wondering why it hasn't made the selection. So you need to press enter at the end uh, to actually validate the selection. The reason it does that is because you can also uh, use it to click to draw a polygon multiple times. So you can click, 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 and click, and click, and then press enter once you're done. Okay, so that's why it's a little bit different to the other tools. Okay, so... Um, we have multiple subsets. We know how to go back and you know change subsets. Now, when you have a, a high-dimensional data set like this one or other ones, often what you might want to do is to, you know, we don't just want to select a rectangle in, in one plot. You want to start you know, making a selection in one plot, then drilling down by selecting something in another space, uh, and then really kind of um, uh, constraining your subset that way. So uh, what you might do is uh, you can say, well, I'll start off by selecting all of the points, uh, all of the planes which are going upwards. Um, but then of those, what you want to do is to um, select basically ones which are at high altitude already. So we want to select all the points that are up here uh, from that subset. So the way you do that is there's these modes at the top. Uh, which can be used to make logical uh, combinations of selections. So, for example, um, the, the default one is called is just called replace. Okay, so that means if you have a selection that's currently shown and you make a new selection, it's just going to replace the old one. Um, so the middle one here is is an AND selection. Um, so it will only select points which were in the original subset and in your new selection. So. Let's click on the middle mode here. And then uh, basically use this tool, which is a, it's to select a vertical range. OK, and then we can click and drag to select these. OK, and so what you'll see is now our selection is a combination of things we selected in here, uh, and then also the ones which uh, are at high altitude. So these, these are now planes at high altitude that are going up. OK, so maybe these took off at some other airport uh, near Boston, but not in Boston. And they're still basically reaching their cruising altitude. OK, so that's uh, there's other kinds of uh, selection com ways of combining selections. You can also, the second one is add to selection. So if you click on this, uh, and then you now go and select a bunch of points over here. This will now add the, any points that were in that rectangle to the existing section. OK, so you can play around with this more if you want. But they, so there's, there's these different kind of logical operations you can do uh, to combine selections. OK, and so when you have a, a file, you know, some data with you know, 20 different fields and you make all these plots, you can really start to say, oh, well, it's interesting if I take these. And then, um, you know, of those uh, selecting things in another viewer, you can really start to uh, drill down on interesting points. Now, the most important thing about this is to remember that this setting up here is uh, it's, it's not a temporary setting, so it's permanent. Once you've clicked on it, it will stay in that mode. So you always have to remember to change back to replace if you just want it to behave normally again. Um, 
the classic mistake I think that, that I've done myself and, and I've seen um, other people do is to leave it in uh, the end mode and then now say, okay, what I want to do is I want to select the points uh, over here. And so then, of course, nothing gets selected because there's no points in that box that were already selected before. Okay, so you have to remember to always switch back to the replace mode. Um, and then you can go back to selecting points as normal. Okay, so if this doesn't work, yes. Question? Can you talk with your logic on two already existing subsets? Can you, if you have two that you want to do Yeah, of these things, you, like you um, Okay, let me. Uh, the easiest way to do that, I think, is to do it programmatically. Um, I think this. I don't think there's an easy way to do it for the GUI uh, combining them. Uh, but it's definitely something we could we could add. I should say, of course, that all of this is like. Uh, if you have ideas like this, then um, please add them to the document, um, the Google Doc, and then uh, maybe we can open issues later on GitHub to uh, to mention those. Um, it seems like something that would be useful. So maybe we could like select multiple ones and then have some kind of, of way of combining them. Okay, so um, now you have your data set here and it's open and you've you know been exploring it, you've been uh, taking uh, selections of the data, uh, but what you really want to do actually now is you think, oh, well, what I really want is, I wish I had a variable in my table that was the fractional change in, in altitude. Okay, so well, one way is we just close down Glue, open a little Python script, open the table, add a new column to the table, uh, which is you know the new variable you want. But the other thing you can do is on the fly you can create new components inside Glue. So um, you can combine various attributes uh, in uh, using just kind of equations, arithmetic expressions, um, and uh, and making new attributes that way. So let's try this out. So there's a button up here that says arithmetic attributes. Okay, so try clicking on that. So we have we have a single data set open, so there's not, you know, you can't select multiple data sets here. But if you had multiple data sets open, you could go here and basically select which data set you want to add your new attribute to. I'm just going to make this change the resolution again. this okay this is good okay that's a little bit better um, so uh, here when you have this window open you can do new arithmetic attribute so this is the equation editor. In here, you can say what you want your variable to be. So uh, in this case, we're gonna make a new uh, variable which is gonna be the fractional change in altitude. So we can do, um, see. So uh, by fractional, I mean that we take the, uh, the vertical rate, the, the basically yeah, the speed at which the plane is going up or down, and then divide it by the altitude. Um, let's not worry too much about what the units are for those values for now, uh, but as conceptually, that's what you want to do. So I'm going to make a new variable called fractional alt change. That's the name of your attribute. Um, and then in here, you can type an equation which combines uh, different components. So the way that you do it is uh, you can either select attributes from this list to use. So you could say, I want to use vertical rate uh, click insert and you'll see that vertical rate now appears in that little window. Um, you'll notice that the way this, this syntax works, you have curly brackets. So it's not just Python, uh, it's it kind of, uh, you have to put curly brackets and then the actual name of the, the component that you want. Um, so if you want, you can just type it directly um, by saying uh, curly bracket altitude. Um, if, it, if there's a mistake, things will, uh, will not, um, for example, if you type the name wrong, it'll appear in orange. Um, if you get it right, uh, it will appear in blue. You also have a, a thing at the bottom here that says valid expression. Um, and so, uh, yeah, if the expression is, is not syntactically valid, uh, you'll end up with an error. Okay, so fractional alt change uh, vert is vertical rate divided by altitude. Uh, click OK. You can now see a list of the different uh, 
essentially derived components or derived attributes inside the data set. Um, and so what happens now is it will add it to the data set, but it doesn't actually compute it until it's needed. Um, so what this means is if you have a very large data set um, where you know each column takes up a gigabyte of memory, you don't necessarily want to be you know adding all these attributes. So the, the way that um, this works is it will actually just compute it on the fly as needed when you use it in a visualization. So I can go um, you know, over to this, um, this view over here, um, and I can change the x-axis to be, uh, or maybe I'll change the, the y-axis uh, to be the fractional altitude change. Okay, so interestingly, um, you know, most points cluster around here, there's some outliers. Um, Okay, so you, this is just an example. It's not in this case. It's not a particularly useful variable in the end, um, but this is just to show that you can do uh, simple expressions. Okay, let's create one which is slightly more useful, um, which is the distance from the airport. Okay, so we already have x and y, but what we want, what we really want to do is just to have a plot which is how far is it from the airport. Um, so let's go back here to arithmetic attributes. Uh, and then we can do new arithmetic attribute. So we'll call it distance from airport. So the nice thing about the expressions here is you can use uh, you can use NumPy functions, for example. Um, you can also use other you know custom functions that you define yourself if you want. Um, and we can take a look later at how to do this. Um, but the, the the key is by default you can use NumPy functions. Um, there's a NumPy function called uh, Hypot, so for hypotenuse, um, and we can give it uh, x and y. So you can either again go here and basically insert x, comma and insert y, uh, or you could just type it if you knew what the attributes were called. Uh, I mean, in the case of x and y, it's pretty simple. Sometimes you have attribute names that are a little bit longer and harder to type. OK, so if you do this, so np.hypot x, y. Um, I can make the, does any, do you want me to make the font larger at the back, or are you good? Yeah, larger. Yeah. So is it always going to be NP for NumPy, or can you use the full NumPy? Sorry, who's sorry? Who's yeah, yeah. Sorry. So you put NP dot for NumPy. Yeah. Is it always going to be NP or? It's uh, for NumPy. I think you can do either NumPy dot or NP dot. Yeah. Um, so there's. Um, I'll show you in a second. There's this way of adding. Um, uh, you, ha you can have a configuration file for Glue, and in there you can define any functions you want to use. And so if you wanted to import it in a different namespace, you could do that. Uh, have it available as npy dot or whatever you want. Yeah. But otherwise, np dot will always work by default. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to change the screen resolution just to make it a little bit easier. Okay, so uh, this is the biggest I can make it. Uh, so np dot hypot uh, x, y. Um, and if I now go back to this plot over here, Okay, um, I can now uh, show on the x-axis uh, distance from the airport, uh, and on the y-axis altitude. Okay, so now um, I might have to switch the resolution back. Right, fine. Um, so this is now showing uh, altitude versus distance from the airport. So what's cool here is you can see now um, basically that uh, you know you have these high altitude planes. Those are just the ones uh, flying over. Uh, and then you see the very nice trends of, of planes taking off and landing. Um, so uh, the cool thing is if you go to, um, to this plot over here, uh, which is showing the vertical rate, and I now uh, make red be the ones that are taking off. Uh, and blue be the ones that are landing. Um, and then go back over here. You can zoom in a bit. So you can start to see that the planes, essentially the planes that are taking off, are actually taking off pretty uh, more steeply than planes that are landing, which is kind of 
has been my experience, at least when you're flying, is it takes ages to come in to land, but then when you take off, it kind of, you know, goes much sharper and it's, it's real. Um, so also the, the plane's landing, you can see they kind of, they kind of approach the airport, but then um, maybe move away, so maybe they're kind of going around the airport and then coming back down again, um, again, uh, more slowly than taking off. All right, but so this shows you that you can derive uh, new attributes uh, during your analysis. Okay, so now let's say that you want to start doing some things programmatically. So you say, okay, well, what I really want is to you know, go and uh, get the data values. I want to make some uh, selections programmatically, uh, like someone was asking before. Um, so there's a terminal that you can bring up. So this is just an IPython terminal inside Glue. Uh, if anyone has issues at this point, if you click and it doesn't pop up, I'd be interested to know. Uh, normally it should work, but we've had a couple of people in the past having issues with the, the terminal. Um, but once you open it, there's a few variables that are available. Um, actually, the title of the terminal says type how to for instructions. Um, and so this says, this is the built-in IPython terminal. You can type any valid Python code here. Um, and you also have access to the following predefined variables. So there's three of them, data collection, um, and I'll explain what that is in a second. Uh, you can also access it with DC, uh, application and hub. So most of the time, the one you're gonna want is data collection. So in Glue terminology, um, you have uh, data sets that you've loaded, and the data collection is just the collection of the data. So the set of, it's a list of data sets uh, that, that you've uh, opened. Um, and it's not truly a list, it's a, it's a specific glue object that allows you to do things on it, but it behaves like a list. So if you type data collection, um, you'll see it says data collection, uh, one data set, uh, zero Boston planes, six hours. Okay, you can also type DC and you should see the same thing. Okay. All right, so then uh, what that tells you is that there's one data set and you can access it with the index zero. So you can do DC zero, um, and this gives you the actual data set. So you can do data equals DC zero. Um, if you do print data, I'm gonna try and, yeah. So if you do print data, um, then you will start to see, it will show you, it will say, I'll just read out for, if you can't read at the back, but it says, data set, uh, sorry, data set, Boston plane six hours, number of dimensions one, uh, shape 29,000, so it's a 29,000 uh, row table. Um, and then it says main components, and then it lists all the different components or attributes in the data set. So things like timestamp, longitude, latitude, and so on. These are the things you can select uh, when you're making a scatter plot or histogram and so on. Um, you'll also see it says derived components, fractional change and distance from airport, uh, and then component, component, sorry, coordinate components, uh, which we're not going to talk about uh, right now. Um, they're not really relevant for a table like data set. Okay, so if you have your data set, you can then do data, um, and then basically like you, you would if it was a dictionary, you do data, square brackets, uh, longitude, and this gives you the values of the longitude. Um, so you can access any of the data values that way. You can also, now th this is uh, where you can start to interact with subsets. So if you, uh, let me see. Okay, so I'll try and read out what I'm saying at the same time so that if you can't read the text, you can get a sense of uh, what to do. Um, so if you do data.subsets, this will show you the subsets in the data. Um, so in this case, the uh, interesting planes and other interesting planes uh, subsets. Um, and again, this is, uh, I think this is a tuple in this case. You can index it to access specific subsets. So you can access uh, the first subset by using square brackets zero. Um, and when you have a subset, so there's, there's a bunch of things you can do with it, but I'm just gonna give you some examples. Um, so one thing you can do is you can access um, any of the attributes you could have accessed on the data set. Uh, so if you do longitude, 
uh, then this will give you all the longitude values of points that are inside the subset. Okay. Um, you can also, an another thing you can do is you can try and get a mask, so true false mask, uh, for whether rows are in the subset or not. So to do that, you do data.subsets0, and then dot two underscore mask, and then uh, brackets. Okay, this gives you a Boolean array uh, of which of the items in the original data set are in your subset. Okay, so we're gonna look at how to modify those next. But any questions so far? Okay, I'm deliberately going a little bit slowly just to make sure people uh, keep up if, if you're trying out stuff. Um, yes? Uh, I keep crashing when I'm loading a TIFF and then a CSV. Is there a reason why that happens? What, so what happens? I load uh, the NYC TIFF image. Yeah. And then I try adding the yellow trip data. Yeah. And it just crashes every time. Is there a reason why? Just take a look. Okay, so uh, one of the questions was how, you know, can you then now make a subset programmatically essentially and overwrite one of the existing subsets or, um, or maybe you make a new one. So yes, uh, you can. Um, so, um, so we're going to do next. So the way that we make uh, selections is, uh, is not, so you could in principle make a Boolean mask, okay, that, that using the values and so on. Um, and then, um, using that Boolean mask to create your selection. But but that's not ideal because the thing is then Glue doesn't really have a concept of what selection you made and it doesn't necessarily know how to apply it to other data sets if you ever link them. Um, it also takes up more memory because you're basically creating this Boolean array. Um, and so the way that Glue works with selections is when you're working programmatically, the best way to do it is um, to, to create what we call a subset state. Um, and I'll just I'll explain what that means. So if you have your data set, uh, you have access to, you can do data.id, um, and then you can access, uh, for example, uh, time. So data.id, square brackets, time. Okay, so this gives you uh, not the actual values of the time, but it gives you, essentially, it's an ID reference to the time. Um, so it's a reference to that field in the data set. And if you use, if you take the data.id time and uh, you do, for example, uh, greater than six, this gives you what's called an inequality subset state. So really what that means is it's just, it's an abstract representation of the selection of taking uh, basically all the values of the time that are greater than six. Um, so what we can do is we can take these and combine them so we can do data id dot time, uh, sorry, dot id, and then square brackets time greater than six. Um, and then we can um, combine it with another selection, which is uh, selecting the ones where the time is less than 18. Okay, so then this will select all the date, well, daytime flights very approximately, uh, flights between 6 a.m. And, and 6 p.m. So again, if I do this, what I end up with is something called an AND state. So the reason it's an AND state is because it's a, it's a state object, it's a subset state object that contains two individual subset state objects that is combined using AND, and like an AND operation. So it has to satisfy both of these. Um, once you have this, so let's uh, put it in a variable called selection. Okay, and then, so this doesn't actually create, you'll see that, you know, nothing has appeared up here. It's not actually created a selection in Glue. Um, we just created a variable called selection. Um, and then next up, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do DC for data collection dot new 
underscore subset underscore group. Okay, so this is how you create a new subset programmatically. Uh, and it takes two things. It takes the label, the, the name of the selection, and then a subset state. So you can do, um, for example, daytime flights, comma, selection. Okay, so if I do this, then it will actually now create a new uh, subset on the top left here containing all the daytime flights. Okay, if you have trouble reading these, I'll just, uh, what I'll do is I'm gonna open up here. This is where the, the detail notes might be useful. So in, there's running notes slash questions. Um, and in this document, there's all the steps. All these commands I'm typing are in that document if you, if you can't read them on the screen. Okay, I'm trying to remember how to modify subsets. So I think it's, um, let's see. Okay, so if you want to mod the, of course I don't expect you to remember all this, you know, the, the, the commands here. Um, a lot of this is described in the documentation, but so it is possible to go and, and update um, certain um, selections. So in this case, what I've done now is I've made a slightly different selection. Um, and then the data collection has something called subset groups, which are like the kind of top level subsets we have. And you can go and then modify the subset state attribute and that will change it. Um, to whatever the new selection is. So of course this is more complicated than doing it through you know, the, the GUI. This is just if you want more control uh, and you really want to, to make selections uh, programmatically, then you can do it. But it's a little bit more advanced. So a lot of people who are using the, the desktop application don't necessarily dive into that level. Yeah, there's um, there's a way to do that. Uh, the there's two things you can do. Um, one is you can um, let me try and find it. So I'm just going to go to the main website, uh, then documentation. Uh, there's a section called washing data for changes. Uh, so that's one option. Um, so there's there's a way of um, you have to use a configuration file, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, but you can do that. The other thing you can do, which is the much easier version, is actually to, um, you can, and, and this, is, this is probably a good time to demonstrate this anyway, you can export this session to a file and then reload it later. So if I do export session, um, then I can call this planes.glue, so we use the extension GLU. Doesn't really matter though. Um, and what this does is it actually will store the session by default without the data. It will just have a reference to the data file that you used, okay? And it will have relative paths. So this is what the options are down here. So there's glue session with absolute paths, glue session with relative paths, and then you can also have a glue session that includes all the data, just in case you want to send it to someone else and you just want to send one file, you can do that. Um, but otherwise you can send, save it with relative paths. Uh, and then when you, what you could do is you could then change the data file and then reload the session and it will actually dynamically reload it with that new data file. Yeah. Okay, so the reason why you might want to do uh, things programmatically is, is uh, of course, the thing about the time, you could easily do that, you know, graphically, you just make a histogram of times and then select the daytime flights. Okay, so it's much simpler. So I could, I could go down here to histogram, uh, change this to say, uh, time uh, and then make a selection uh, for just the planes in a certain time range. Okay, that's way easier than what I was showing at the terminal. But to give another example of why you might want to do this, uh, so one thing you could do is you could say, um, you could say, okay, I want to try to find out what flights you know were there, which which is the flight that we detected the most points for, right? Which, which was the, yeah, basically, um, the flight with the most individual points in this data set. 
So I'm just going to show this example. You don't have to type it all out if you don't want, but just to give you a sense. You could do from collection, uh, from collections import counter. Um, so, uh, and then you could do uh, count equals uh, counter data. And there's a column called call sign, which is the, basically it's kind of the flight code for the flight. Um, and I can do count dot most common and do the five, com five most common flights. Um, and I end up with uh, these five flights here. Um, interestingly, we can actually just take one of these codes. Usually, you can just take these codes and Google them, and you can find out what, what kind of plane it is. So it looks like this one is uh, basically this flight, the, this plane here. Okay, It's literally this plane. Uh, so it's a small plane. And actually, that kind of makes sense, because the smaller planes go slower, so they stay in the airspace for longer, and so you get more points. Um, so now what we can do is we can try and select all the points for this flight. So I can do selection equals data.id call sign and then equals uh, n, sorry, what was it? Uh, N259AF. Okay, so this will, again, this is like the abstract selection, so it's using data.id. So if I do that, I end up with uh, this subset state that I can uh, make a selection with. Um, and I can do dc.newSubset group. Uh, I'll call it ns, sorry, n259af uh, selection. Okay, so now what's happened is I've selected just uh, the, the, the points for that flight. So it's getting a little bit confusing. What I can do is I can actually just remove uh, some of these um, and then change the color from, to something a bit nicer. Okay, so now you can see the trajectory just for that flight. Um, so it looks like it, it probably landed, also maybe took off. It um, was there a bunch of times. So. Okay, and it actually stayed pretty low. I guess it's a, it's a pretty small plane, so maybe someone was learning in it or something like that. Uh, or maybe they're just not allowed to go very high. Um, it also looks like they flew uh, at s several times during the day. So, um, let's see. Ah, yes, no, that's right. Okay, so it looks like it flew twice, uh, once around 1 p.m. and once around 5 p.m. Okay, so that's probably why there's a lot of points for that. So anyway, the idea is you can go and programmatically try to select things that, that you might find interesting uh, in the data. Um, you can also write custom functions you know, that do much more complicated selections and then use those in the terminal if you want. Okay, so the last thing I want to show in terms of the terminal is that we can also programmatically change uh, a lot of things to do with the actual uh, the viewers. So um, let's say that what you want to do is to programmatically change what's on uh, one of the axes. Now, in reality, you would probably not really want to do that because when you're using the, the desktop GUI, um, you can just change it by you know going to 2D scatter here and then changing what's on the axis. Um, but it's just good to know that if you need uh, to access any information about the viewers and change it programmatically, you can. And this becomes useful once you want to start uh, launching Glue programmatically, which we'll take a look at in a minute. Okay, so uh, what we can do is, um, if you, so remember that there were several variables that were accessible in here. If you type how to, it tells you there's data collection, application, and hub. So the application variable, uh, that's actually where we're going to try to find information about the different viewers that are there. So you can do application.viewers. Uh, this gives you a reference to all the different viewers that exist uh, in the application. Um, by default, viewers will give you a list of tabs. So you'll notice up here it says tab one. Uh, you can actually make multiple tabs so that when you run out of space, you can just open any number of tabs. You can actually rename the tabs if you want as well. Uh, so uh, just in case you want to, you know, you have pretty complex sessions at the end with multiple tabs, um, you know, multiple viewers in each tab and so on. So application viewers gives you a list of tabs. So you do, you, ac you square bracket zero to access the first tab, uh, which is the current one. 
and then let's say that we want to access the second scatter plot, which is over here. Then you would do square brackets one. And this gives you a reference to this viewer over here. Okay, so each viewer has a state attribute. Uh, so this state attribute contains basically all of the, the, the settings uh, for this viewer. So each of these settings here, when you do, do view.state, you can see all these, matches up with something that's in the GUI over here. So for example, I could do uh, viewer.state.x underscore, well, maybe, I, yeah, x underscore min, or maybe x underscore max equals 20. So I'm changing x max to be 20. Programmatically, and it, up, it refreshes in, in the, the plot. Um, you can also access, uh, basically, each state class has a layers, a dot layers attribute, uh, which is basically a list of uh, these layers over here in each viewer. So if I do viewer.state.layers and then uh, zero, I get, I get the first uh, layer here. Uh, and then if I do dot one, then I get this scatter layer state for the subset. Okay, the order is, uh, it's actually bottom up, so um, the, the first layer is the one that's at the bottom over here. Um, and then if you have, uh, you know, the, the layer for the subset, for example, you can then change, uh, I think you should be able to change the color. Okay, so I just changed it to purple uh, or, you know, yellow or something, um, you can go and, and change things like this. Now, again, there's no reason why you would want to do this while you're in the GUI, but you might want to do it if you want to start up GUI programmatically and preset things in a certain way, uh, which we'll look at very shortly. Okay, so any questions so far? This is all with a single data set, but we're gonna start talking about linking data sets together. Yes. So yeah, uh, th there's there's no way in the GUI right now to um, to see what the kind of logic of the selection is. Uh, you would have to do that through the terminal right now. But it, it would be an, a, one one we have had you know the idea that request in the past to to have a way of graphically seeing the selections. Um, I think it would work for a lot of the kind of simple ones. You can actually do arbitrarily complex selections. At which point you'll probably just have to say like custom selection or something. Uh, but yes, it's it would be nice to have something like that. So but we don't have it at the moment. Yeah, you have to go to the, the terminal and see what the, the, the logic behind the selection is. If I save a session, will it save my terminal session too so I can go back to the history and see? No, I think that the saving the session for now doesn't save the, the, the IPython session, uh, the, the history of commands. Um, I'm actually not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's possible or not. Like if, if, if we did, I'm not sure if it's actually possible to implement whether we could arbitrarily um, go back and repopulate the history or not. I, I don't know enough about that. So, yeah. It's an interesting idea, though. Um, yeah. Um, by the way, any of these ideas, you know, please just add them to the document. You know, it's possible we could then implement something like that, maybe with your help. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To undo, yes, uh, so um, yeah, uh, if you, so let's say that you select uh, this over here and you say, oh no, wait, I want to go back to what we had before. I think this should work, undo apply subset. Uh, yeah, and it's command Z. I mean, it, it, so internally it does actually, it has a, it has a whole list of all the, the kind of history of the selections you made. Uh, if you save a session, it will lose that information. It's, it's kind of, it's more, the, the idea behind that was more just to kind of, um, it's more like an undo button just in a normal application, it's if you make a mistake, but we don't we don't save the whole history of, of the selections that you made. Is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah, that, and I guess, is there a way to print out the data from the selection? Oh, to print out the data from your selection? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, so yes, there's two things you can do. You can either, um, in the terminal, use uh, what was showing before, where you do something like, uh, 
DC zero for the first, well, actually just data dot subsets, uh, and then uh, zero and then call sign for example, and that will show you you know the call signs for that selection, which should basically all be this N two five nine AF. If you want to actually export it to a file, so you have your selection and you want to export it to a file, you can do that also. Uh, so we have a button up here, export data subsets. Um, and then you can say, I want to export the, the Boston Plains data. Uh, I want to export just this subset, and I want to export only certain columns. And then you can save it to a CSV file or something like that. Uh, and you can easily see the selection then. Yeah. You can always then, at a later time, reload it into Glue as a full data set if you want. So, yeah. Yeah, so so there's there's a way to um, to link uh, yeah specific axes of plots. Unfortunately, right now it's only programmatic, but we want we want to make expose it for the GUI. Um, there's uh, there's a function called keep in sync, and uh, I can maybe show you later. But if uh, basically there's a yeah there's a function we can use to link attributes on different uh, states of different viewers. Yep. Yep. Any other questions for now? Okay, so uh, what we're gonna do now is um, we're gonna try and link, uh, we're gonna start to look at what happens when you have multiple data sets. So uh, this specific data set, I, I only have one file, and so there's nothing, I don't have anything interesting to link it to right now. Um, but so we're gonna open another data set. You can either close glue, uh, or if you want, you can just go to another terminal and uh, remember to switch to the correct environment and uh, type glue, um, and then that will open a new instance. So you can have multiple instances of glue at, open at the same time. So I'll do that. Um, so remember to switch environment. So again, the activate command is up here. Uh, if you're using Honda. So in the glue examples data folder, there's a folder called uh, astronomy. So we're just going to use an astronomy data set. You don't need to know anything about astronomy uh, to, to use this. It's a uh, it's pretty straightforward data set with one image and, and one uh, catalog of points. Um, and we'll go to the W5 folder. OK, so in there, there's a bunch of files. Uh, the files we're interested in are w5.fits and w5psc.csv. Okay, so um, just for this example, I'm going to show you, you can either open the files by doing glue, then the file names, um, but if you want, you can also just open glue and then open the, the files through a normal uh, GUI. So once you're in here, you can do import data uh, and then select uh, multiple files. So we want the w5. Uh, underscore PSC and the w5. fits files. Okay, if anyone has issues finding those files, uh, just you know, use your stickers. Okay, so um, very briefly, the image is, it's an infrared image of a certain part of the sky, um, and uh, the, the table, uh, which is uh, W5 underscore PSC, uh, is uh, a catalog of stars that are in that region that were extracted from uh, another bunch of images, uh, not this one. And so what we want to do is uh, basically compare those two. So uh, just someone was asking earlier about renaming subsets. You can actually rename data sets if you don't like the names. So for example, if you have W5PSC, you can double click on it and call this, uh, let's say, table. Uh, and you can double click on W5 and call this image. OK. so. Uh, again, I can make different visualizations. So if you click and drag the, on the table data set, uh, you can make a 2D scatter plot. Uh, you can also make a histogram. Um, so let's show something more interesting on here. So we can show um, there's variables down here which are 4.5 minus 5.8. I'll explain what that is in a second. Uh, and then 5.8 minus 8.0. So you can use those. Those are basically, uh, they're like kind of differences between brightnesses at different wavelengths. Uh, and so it tells you if things are more red or more blue uh, between two wavelengths, if they're brighter in one band or another. Um, and so usually stars basically separate out in that kind of diagram a little bit. Um, 
usually things are redder or younger um, in, in this context. So this is the podcast. Yeah. Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is so it's yeah. Um, so um, and the data is from uh, Wise and Spitzer, I think. So yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, I'm not going to give a crash course in astronomy. <laughs> so, it's just, uh, um, so the histogram here, we can also show you something more interesting, which is uh, let's say uh, JMAG, which is the, it's the mag magnitude at a wavelength of one micron, roughly. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to take the image data set and we're also going to create viewers. So we're going to do 2D image. Uh, so that's going to show us uh, the image on the sky. Um, again, as for other kinds of viewers, you can change you know, the appearance. So if you go to the layer options here, you can change uh, what the limits are, for example, for the, the image. So if you go to limits and where it says min max, instead you select 99.5, it's going to exclude the brightest and faintest pixels and try to choose better limits for the, the plot. So, and then as for other viewers, you can you know zoom around, uh, pan, and so on. Okay, um, and then I'm going to finally make take the image and make a histogram plot of the pixels. Okay, and again, uh, we can try and play around with uh, with the settings of the histogram to make it more interesting. Um, we can change the upper limit. I mean, the details don't matter too much, but um, we can change this. We can make the, the y-axis be a log scale, and then you'll see all of the bins in the histogram. So you can do that by going to limits and then clicking on the log. OK, so what we have now is uh, two data sets loaded into Glue. Um, and uh, we have scatterplot and the histogram at the top are for one of the data sets, and the image and the histogram on the bottom are for the other data set. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a selection in the scatter plot over here. So what happens when you do that is you'll see that there's a selection that's appeared in the histogram at the top. Um, if you want, you can go to the histogram. So one thing I didn't explain before, I should have explained, is that the options on the left are for the active viewer. And the active viewer is the one with the blue box around it. You can, if, when you click on a certain viewer, it changes the options on the left. So I should have made that clearer before. Um, so if you go to the histogram and then uh, you can do normalized, it will show you a normalized, it will renormalize the histogram so you can just see the kind of relative shapes. So what you'll notice is there's nothing on the bottom. Okay, the selection hasn't propagated to the viewers on the bottom. Likewise, if you make a selection in the image, what will happen is it will go and that should be red. Don't know why it's blue, um, but this sh basically shows you the subset of of those um, of those pixels in the histogram. Okay, the, these are the it's the histogram of the pixel values, um, but it doesn't show the same objects at the top. Okay, so that's because we haven't told Glue how the data sets are related, so we need to link them together. So up here you have a button called Link Data. Uh, and this is where, uh, basically, you can set up any arbitrary links between data sets. Um, so in this case, what we have is we have only two data sets. The, the top section is basically going to show you like a network graph of, of the data sets. We only have two, so it's not going to look particularly interesting. If you remember, at the start of the tutorial, I showed you an example with five or six data sets, where you can start to see links between multiple data sets. Um, but these are, are both selected currently, which is why they're green. Uh, you can see them here, data set one, data set two. Um, but there's no line between them, because there's no link. If you click on RAJ2000, okay, which is it's basically it's the like the longitude in the um, in the table. Um, you can then select right ascension in the image, uh, and then have those be uh, linked. So we've now selected RAJ2000 and right ascension, and we click on glue attributes. Okay, now you have a line between the data sets. There's actually two coordinates we need to link because we want to yeah, link them spatially. We need to link longitude and latitude. The latitude is called DEJ2000 in the table and declination in the image. Okay. So this could be, you know, if you had like, a, and there's, there's an example data set uh, that I'll mention uh, a little bit later. Um, you know, this could be like a, a, a basically a table of longitudes and latitudes on Earth, and then you know, have some image that's basically, again, a satellite image, you could you would link them in the same way. So then you click glue attributes, and you see your links appear here. OK. 
So now we have two links, identity RA, J2000 is linked to right ascension, and D, J2000 link is linked to declination. Okay, so once you do this, click OK. And now what happens is you'll notice straight away that uh, there's basically um, a bunch of points that uh, appear in the selection up here. I'm going to just redo the selection just so you can uh, see it happen. So I'm going to select points here, and then now uh, the selection appears in the top over here. Okay, so for some reason this, uh, I'm just gonna make a new histogram. Yeah, there you go. Okay, for some reason the, uh, the histogram view was out of sync, so. Okay, so now what happens is if I make a selection in the image, I see that propagate uh, to uh, the panels at the top, okay? Um, but now, if I make a selection up here, okay, what will happen is that, uh, let me, okay, um, so I'm making a selection at the top up, up here, and what will happen is, again, the selection propagates to the right, but it doesn't propagate to the image. Okay, so you'll say, but the data sets are linked, so why doesn't it propagate them? So the reason it doesn't is, is because um, of the way, link, the way links work in Glue, uh, selections only propagate over dimensions that you've linked. So I've got a couple of slides just to illustrate that because it's, it's a reasonably important point. So you have two data sets, okay? So on the left, there's uh, a table with columns A and B, and on the right, there's a table with columns C and D. Um, the, the one on the left, you know, I've made a selection, which is, I've said, I want to select all the things with B between one and three. Um, and so it selected the three rows highlighted in green. The way that the links work in glue is it will then say, okay, um, I've linked B and D, and so it then applies the same selection, okay, which is to select points that are uh, where D is between one and three in the other data set. So there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between things on the left and things on the right. It's more that it takes the selection and it applies to the same. So if you think of the example I showed just now, um, we were making a selection in columns that were not the spatial position. Okay. So if I go to this glue window here, uh, this isn't, this, these are not spatial positions. So if I select it, it doesn't know how to propagate that to the image and select the, the same pixels in the image. If I change this plot to be... Um, RA J2000 and DEC J2000, okay? This is now showing the points, like, spatially. Um, I can make a selection, and that selection now propagates to the image. Okay, the selections have to propagate over dimensions that are linked. There's another kind of selection in Glue, um, which for now isn't accessible for the GUI, but you can access programmatically. Um, which is it's uh, more what you might think of as kind of one-to-one -one links. Um, and the idea here is that if you have a table on the left, uh, same table as just now, and we select the same rows as just now, what happens is that you can use, you can set up one-to-one -one links between columns. You can say column A and column C represent the same exact thing. Um, on a discrete level, not we're not talking about you know that it's the same coordinate and we want to apply the same kind of coordinate selection, but it's more an identity. So anything that's marked A in the left has a correspond you know corresponding entries called A in the right. And so if you do that kind of link, then it will select any row in the right table which has the first column set either to A or C. Okay, and so that's why it selects those. If you're interested in that, just let me know, um, and uh, I can show you how to do this programmatically. And then the plan is to add it to the GUI later on. All right, so any questions about linking? Yes? So to that end, like, if you had a data set that had kind of a traditional primary key, then you could still do it in the GUI without having to worry about the discrete linking? Um, so if you have a, yeah, m multiple data sets with things like primary keys, for now it's done programmatically through IPython, uh, but the, the plan is basically to just make it so that here you would have two options. Basically you could say, I want to link this either as kind of 
these kind of coordinate links where it's more like continuous links and discrete links, essentially, uh, where the discrete links would be kind of primary key links. Yeah. Again, if anyone's interested in helping, uh, it, it should actually be reasonably straightforward to implement that. Um, but we want to make it so that these different kinds of links are exposed for the GUI. Yeah. All right, any other questions about links so far? Yes. Yeah. And then you can see how it falls in the R index. What if I would then want to see that same selection on the image? Uh, yep, yeah, very good question. So um, you can, so let's see, we're now making, um, so I'm going back to showing this is, these are colors uh, for the stars. And uh, I select a bunch of stars here. Again, that selection doesn't propagate, but you can show the actual points on top of the image. So to do that, um, you need to expand the subset here. Okay. Now, one thing I didn't really explain is that in Glue, there's the kind of the top-level subset, and then the subset applied to each specific data set. So the top-level subset is just the concept that you're selecting, you know, all things that are where you know, like B is between one and three, or or like you know, I've selected this region in the diagram. It's not specific to one data set. It can be applied to multiple data sets. Okay, and then um, if the data sets are linked, it can be applied to multiple data sets. So. But I can expand this subset and see the subset applied to specific data sets. And so if I do subset one table, I can drag it on top of the image and then see that appear, okay? which is what you're asking. Um, and so now if I go back and update this subset, uh, then you'll see the distribution of points change. Okay, so this could just as well be a satellite image and then some points of, you know, some uh, points in longitude, latitude on the Earth, and you would get, you, you know, this could, you could do this as well. Okay, so any other questions for now? Okay, so I realize it's a lot of information. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is uh, just uh, show some quick examples of how we can start to customize glue. Then uh, we can have a break, uh, just a breather. Um, and then when we come back from that, uh, you can take some time to you know, explore it yourself a little bit more, um, and I'll provide more example data sets uh, for you to do that with. And then after that, we'll talk about uh, the Jupyter stuff. So just before the break, uh, for about 20 minutes, I'll just show you some things to do with the customizing that you can also try out. Okay, so um, there's two, well, there's, there's more than two, but there's, there's several levels on which you can customize glue. The first one is you might just want to say, what I want to do is I want to basically, I always want to do this kind of analysis where I have two scatter plots and an image and this and that, and I want to always, you know, color code things in a certain way, and so I, I really, you know, you want to always launch glue so that it has some things open by default. Um, so to do that, there's, um, so I've, I've Provided an example in this on this web page here, so that's the the wiki page. Um, if you go down to the bottom where it says scripts, okay, there's something called script to launch glue programmatically. Okay, I won't, you know, make you type it all uh, now, so that that wouldn't be very useful. But what I want to show is just that. So it's a, it's a reasonably simple script, um, and it follows a, uh, you would always follow this kind of pattern if you were launching Glue programmatically. So what you would want to do is probably uh, maybe load some data sets, um, add the data sets to the data collection here. You can set up links programmatically if you want. So if there's always the same kind of links you want to set up, you can do that. Um, this then creates the Glue application. Um, and then at that point, so you could just stop there if you wanted, uh, but then we can also, in this case, create uh, default data viewers that are there. So this will make a, an image viewer. It will then add the image and the catalog to the image viewer. You can resize the, the image viewer, so you can you know, resize it as if you were using the, the GUI. Um, and uh, change, you know, this is just changing the appearance of the image. Uh, anything, any of the state, the reason I was showing you the state variables before is because they're super useful when you're doing this. Because you can do, you know, state dot layer zero, which gives you the first layer dot percentile, which is basically equivalent to one of the GUI settings for changing uh, the, the limits for the image. Um, and then this is uh, making a scatter plot. 
uh, and then again you can set the size you can shift it by some amount so it doesn't it doesn't overlap with the image um, and then you can do scatter viewer dot state dot x at equals and then give it uh, one of the attributes in your in your data okay so if you want, you can try try this out. If you want to try it out, uh, try it inside the W5 directory uh, because it uses those files. So you can just call it anything you want. Um, so I've called it start glue. I'm just going to paste the script in here. And then if you run it with Python start underscore glue dot pi. Okay, it launches Glue, loads the data set, sets up the links. Uh, so if I go to the link data dialog, you'll see the links are already set up. Um, and then you have, you know, it's resized them to be square and then put them next to each other. Uh, and so now I can just directly dive in and start to make selections and have those propagate. Okay, so you can actually use this to then build scripts. Uh, you know, you could, you could imagine your script would take a command line argument, which is, you know, the name of the file or the files you want. Uh, and if you have to do the same kind of analysis on multiple kinds of files, you can make a convenient script like this that will go and, and launch Glue uh, with everything already set up. Okay, there's, um, I should say that all of this is in the documentation. Uh, I'm just going to show you. Uh, there's a specific page on um, programmatically configuring viewers. So this, this shows an example like this where you basically start up Glue programmatically and then it has a link it has links to all the different state classes that exist in Glue. You can say, okay, I have a scattered plot viewer, which things can I change? And then you have a list of all the attributes you can access and change programmatically. Okay, so are there any questions about this, about starting Glue up programmatically? Okay, so the next level of customization is that you can create a configuration file uh, for Glue. And uh, that's described also in the documentation. Um, now, this file, you can either put it in a global location so that it applies wherever you start Glue on the computer. Um, I usually prefer to just have those files in the directory where you're launching Glue from uh, because maybe you need different configuration for different projects. Uh, a configuration file is just a file called config.py. Um, and if Glue detects that file, it will run it uh, when it launches. Uh, and so you can define a whole bunch of things in, in there. Um, there's a page called Customizing Your Glue Environment, uh, and that lists a lot, not quite all, but a lot of the things you can uh, customize. So for example, um, you can make custom data loaders. So if you have a file format you want to add support for, you can do that. Um, you can uh, basically have a way of uh, defining a plugin to how to export data or subsets. So if you have a certain file you want to format, you want to write to, uh, you can also define that. Um, I'm just skipping over some. You can add color maps. So if you really want to add a rainbow or jet color map to Glue, you can, uh, but we don't provide that by default. Uh, but if you you can basically define whatever color map you want um, uh, in Glue. Um, and so on. So there's all these things you can customize. And actually, a lot of them don't require any knowledge of Qt or how to write desktop GUI. Okay? So we're going to look at one which is uh, called Custom Menu Bar Tool. So this is a tool that you'll be able to access through the menu in Glue. So if I go to a Glue session here, um, it would appear under this plugins uh, menu. All right. So this is one that's short enough that we can type it out if you want. Feel free to try it out at the same time. Um, we can always go back to, it doesn't really matter which data set you're going to look at, but I'm going to back, go back to the planes folder. Um, and uh, I'm going to make a config.py file. So the, what we need to do is first we need to import the the function that will the decorator that will register this uh, this plugin. So you can do from glue.config import import menu bar plugin. Um, and so this basically uh, it's it's used as a decorator on the function, which you basically would just do. Um, so I'm going to define the function here. Um, and so here, if you put menu bar plugin, then Glue will know that this is uh, basically supposed to be used as a menu bar plugin, and as opposed to, for example, a data loader and so on. Um, you can give it a name. The name is what's going to appear in the menu. So, um, 
So let's make a plugin which changes the color of the data set. So, uh, so we're going to do make all data uh, orange. Okay. Um, so this function then, the only requirements is the function has to take two arguments. The first one is, uh, it's called a session object. We don't need to care about what this is for this plugin. Uh, and the second one is the data collection, which is what we'll be using. Okay, so uh, we've imported the menu bar plugin decorator. We started to write a function, decorate the function uh, with menu bar plugin. Um, and then uh, in here, you can do whatever you want. So uh, it can, you could actually have code that use Qt if you wanted to pop up a window, but you don't have to. So in this case, we're just going to loop over the data collection. So this iterates over each data object. Um, and then for each data object, we can do data.style.color equals orange. Okay. All right, so now um, I'm going to open up, uh, I'll just open this up with both data sets. Um, and so now you have your data sets over here. If I go to plugins, then now I see make all data orange. And if I click on it, it makes the data orange. Okay, so now if I make a scatter plot, the data's going to be orange. Uh, if I change it back, just to show you that it will it will live update plot, so I'll change it to bright green for some reason. Um, and if I do make all data orange, it will go back and make all the data orange. Okay, so of course this is not a particularly useful plugin. Uh, there's more interesting plugins you could imagine writing, uh, but the idea is you can access anything in the data collection. You could go and you know add columns to data. You could color code them according to some criterion that you have, um, and so on. Okay, so just to show you again what that looks like. Um, it's just a simple uh, Python function that's two lines long, basically. Just add a decorator onto it, and there you go. You have your, your plugin available for the GUI. Okay. All right. So just to show an example that's a little bit more complex. Uh, by the way, if you want to uh, the code for these examples, it's also on the wiki page on GitHub. Sorry. Um, down here below this, there's the, the plugin for changing the data color. Um, the next one we're going to write is, I'm just going to type it out just to, to make it a little bit more. Um, so, yeah. So I'm just going to rename this to uh, something else. Um, I'm going to make a new file, config.py. What we're going to do now is we're going to make a custom data loader. So, unfortunately, I don't have any example data files in this repository, which Luke can't read. Uh, and so, in, but you could imagine having a data set, you know, which is in some format. Uh, so maybe you're doing medical science and you want to read in nifty files. Um, and uh, Glue doesn't deal with that. You could write a custom loader for that. Again, without any writing any code for the GUI. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to make, since we don't have that, we're going to make a data loader that automatically adds columns to the, the, plane, the file with the planes uh, in, from Boston. Um, and it's, that's also a valid use of a data loader, is to essentially override the default behavior of the loaders in Glue. So uh, the first thing we, we can do is we can just write a function that um, called read plain data. It should basically take a file name. Um, and the only requirement is that this function has to return a Glue data object. Uh, so we're going to use pandas. Uh, and pandas has a function called read CSV. So I can now do df equals read CSV file name. So that will read in the, um, the table into a data frame. Uh, we then have to create a glue data object. And so that's done uh, with the glue, uh, this glue.core import data. So the data class is what you need. Um, you create an empty data set, um, and then we can loop over the columns in the data frame. Okay, um, and then we can add those columns to the data. So we would do data square brackets column equals df square brackets column. 
Okay, that's basically going to copy each of the columns from the data frame into a glue data object. You can give it a name if you want, so plain data. Okay. All right, so now what we want to do is also maybe add some new columns to make it more interesting. We can do data distance and then uh, basically compute um, same as what we were doing just now, except that this is now actually going to compute it and put it in the data. And Glue, once the data is open, Glue won't even know that that was a special kind of derived data set. It's just going to uh, add it as a, as a full kind of column. Um, so th this will basically just add a new column to the data that's the distance from the airport. And then you can return the data. Yeah, but we don't have to. I'll, yeah, I need to import NumPy. Oh. So yeah, but uh, I think NumPy might be in. Uh, it might already be in the namespace for this, but definitely do it explicitly. Yeah, uh, that was my bad. Um, okay, so this in itself isn't enough for Glue to know that this is a data loader because all you've done is you've defined a function, but it doesn't know whether it's a menu bar plugin, a data loader, and so on. So what we need to do is we need to import uh, from Glue.config import data underscore factory. Um, and so we can do data factory and then give it a name. So we can call it the plain data reader. Okay, so now data factory tells Glue this is a data loader. Now, if I do this, what's going to happen is um, so again, the code for this, by the way, if you want, is, is on the wiki page. So if I close my window too quickly, or if you can't read, uh, it's all available on the wiki page over here. Um, I'm going to launch this, and I'm going to uh, open the, once I'm in the correct environment, I <laughs> so I can now load the, the Boston Plains file. So what's going to happen is it's still going to read it with the default reader in Glue, because how would it know that it has to use that specific one? So well, one way it could know is that when you import the data, um, at the bottom of the window here, you can select which reader to use, and you can see one of them is plain data reader. So if I do that, and I read in uh, this data set again, okay, this one would be called plain data because in my data factory, I called it plain data. Uh, and this data set will have an additional column. So one of the viewers you can use is a table viewer um, just to actually just view the, the table. Um, and then you can see one of the columns is distance at the end. Okay, so how would you make it so that it would re use that reader by default? Um, now, there's the concept of having an, an identifier function. Um, so you can do, sorry. Um, I can basically make a function called is plain data. Um, and what this does is it's a function that basically returns true if, if, it, if I think I can read it uh, with my specific reader, false otherwise. So I'm going to do something uh, very uh, silly, which is just to check um, if the file name has the word plain in it. Um, but you could actually do anything you want in here. You could look at the first 100 bytes of the file and decide whether it's a file format you want to support, uh, and so on. So you, you, can do, you don't have to just look at the file name. You can also open the file, inspect it, and so on. Um, and then when we create the data factory here, we would say identifier equals is plain data. So what that does is it will then um, it knows that it can it can use the identifier and if the identifier if that function returns true, it can use this data reader. But there's one more thing we need to do, which is that it will basically each data reader has a priority, and we need to make sure that this one has top priority. Uh, because maybe there's another uh, data reader for CSV files that has a non-zero priority. So here we just need to set, basically, we can do priority equals 1,000. And it's going to make sure that this is one of the first ones that will be checked. If, it, if this can be used to read the file, it will just use this and nothing else. So now I can do glue Boston planes six hours. Um, and this should now use uh, this data loader. So it says plain data. Um, and it has access to the distance column. Okay, so 
uh, that's how you would create a, data, a custom data loader. Again, you can use this to add support for any kind of file format you want um, in, in Glue. Okay, so are there any questions at this point about this? Customizing, there's, there's a lot more things that you can customize. I just wanted to give you a sense of a couple of examples. Um, so what we're gonna do now is I suggest we take a break, maybe for like 15, 20 minutes, uh, just to breathe a bit. Um, and then I think at quarter to four, um, I'll give some information about other data sets you can explore. Uh, you can then use some time to you know, try and explore it yourself. If you have any questions about, you know, that are specific to your domain, uh, how you want to customize Glue and so on, uh, we're available. So Hope Chen, who's down here, can also uh, you know, help with, with questions. Um, and so, uh, and then around, I think, quarter to five, so we'll have an hour for that, and then at quarter to five, we'll switch gears and, and uh, look a bit at the, the Jupiter stuff. Um, so let's meet back here at quarter to four, um, and then, yeah. Okay, so um, since it's quarter to four, uh, I just wanna say a couple of words, but then I'll, I'll leave you to try stuff out. Um, I want to say that, uh, so the idea is over the next hour, uh, if you have data sets you want to try and load into Glue, uh, give it a try. If it means having to write custom data loaders, give that a try. Um, if there's any questions you have about using it, applying it to your own data, uh, we'll be happy to help, we'll come around. Um, if you don't have data that you want to play around with, but you still want to play around with something, um, there's a variety of other data sets in the Glue examples data uh, directory that you downloaded. Um, and so what I've done is on the wiki page, uh, I've mentioned exploration time here. Um, this, this is a good time. If you want to try and install plugins uh, to try stuff out with Glue, uh, you can try that. So there's a, a link to a list of available plugins, um, which is here. Uh, this page basically describes some of the plugins that we have for Glue. Uh, feel free to try and install some. Let us know if you have issues. Um, and I've put a little paragraph here, which is there's a folder called Taxis, uh, which is in the Glue Examples data uh, folder. Um, and this is, um, uh, there's two data files in there. One is, uh, it's, it's basically this famous taxi data set from, for New York. Um, and it has all the trips. In this case, it's a subset of the data set. So it has all the trips over a month, I think, with one particular company. Um, and it has basically a record of all the kind of the taxi trips that were taken, how much they cost, where they started from, where they went to, and so on. Um, and there's also uh, a, a satellite image of New York. Um, it's not particularly high resolution, but just to get the idea. And so if you want a challenge, then try first to install the geospatial plugin. Uh, you need to install that to read the file correctly. Uh, and then you can try and read in the, the catalog, the table of taxis, uh, the satellite image. You can try and link them the way we've linked other data sets before. Um, and then you should be able to overlay the taxi data on top of the satellite image, and then also play around, make selections, uh, try and explore the, the data, see if you see any interesting trends. Um, so I've put the paragraph describing that there. Uh, that's just if you want inspiration for, for something to work on. Uh, but feel free to just use this time otherwise to just explore it with your own data too. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna take uh, 10, 15 minutes uh, just to, to show you a little bit of the Jupiter stuff and then you can continue playing around either with that or what you were, you know, trying to work on before. Um, so, let's see. So if you go to the, um, uh, this, this page on, on the GitHub wiki. Um, then at the bottom, so I'll, I'll just go, there's a, there's a link to Jupyter Notebooks, okay? Um, so I'll get to those in a second. I just, I think. Okay, so the, what I mentioned before was that we have multiple front ends uh, for, for Glue. We, most of the Glue code, you know, when you're dealing with things like, um, like the data collection and subsets and things like that, in the same way that you've been dealing with them for the IPython terminal, um, that's basically independent of whether you're using Qt or uh, other frameworks for the front end. So, um, so what we did was we, we started a, a new package called, uh, it's called Glue-Jupyter. Uh, it's not yet, there's not a stable release of it right now. Um, the reason why is because actually several the dependencies that we need uh, have not been released yet. So, uh, but hopefully later this summer we should have a, a first stable release. Um, 
it's extremely experimental right now, uh, but it's just a kind of proof of concept to um, to really show that we can do this uh, and use various widget libraries basically in uh, in Jupyter uh, to interface with the glue. So there's various reasons why you might want to use uh, Jupyter, which is that, uh, for example, if you, you you're trying to analyze a large data set which is uh, remote, then it's sometimes it's easier to just spin up uh, an instance of Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab and uh, do your analysis there rather than have to download the data uh, and launch a, a desktop uh, app. Um, so with that in mind and the, the caveat that it's basically very experimental and so there will be bugs, uh, I'll just uh, show you a little bit uh, what it looks like. Um, you are, are welcome to try it out. There's two links here. Uh, these, are, these should be equivalent. Uh, the first link opens the notebooks using MyBinder, but I figured that if other tutorials are also using MyBinder, uh, they might be saturated. So if you have issues with the first link, you can use the second link, uh, or you could just try the second one directly. Um, so what this does is it will open inside the Glue Jupyter repository, um, which is on GitHub. We have a variety of notebooks that demonstrate uh, some examples. So uh, the first example I'm going to show is one that uses the data set for the planes. So the very first example I showed today with the, the Qt app. Um, and uh, so I'll show you a little bit what you could do in, in Jupyter. So it takes a second or two, especially if other people are uh, using it too. Uh, let me just uh, I'll try opening this one too. I'll just open it on both just to see which one opens first. Um, while this loads, I should also say that uh, currently um, the this this mostly works in in uh, Jupyter notebooks. Um, but it's in principle, it should easily work in Jupyter Lab as well. Uh, the problem again is that some of the visualization packages that we rely on don't work fully in, in Jupyter Lab yet. Um, so it's just a matter of uh, a little bit of time before that happens. Um, so, okay. So once you one of these links works, uh, you should be presented with uh, basically a list of directories. This is essentially the, it's the same kind of uh, data than you had in the Glue examples data directory. Uh, so if we go to um, astronomy, no, actually, sorry, we go to planes, um, then there's a, a notebook to do with uh, the, the Boston Planes data set. Okay. So one thing I should say is don't try and run, do the thing of running all the cells straight away because um, the last visualization is a little bit more computationally intensive. Uh, so we'll just do the first few ones first. Um, so uh, the first cell here basically just fetches uh, the, the same data set that you were trying before. So it's the, uh, the Boston plane data set for over six hours. Now, the way that you use glue inside uh, Jupyter is, of course, a little bit different to the desktop version. Um, so um, most things have to be done programmatically. That's for, the, for this notebook version. In future, we actually plan that once the Jupyter Lab version is working, we can actually start making also like a dashboardy style version of Glue, which then wouldn't require any code. Um, and uh, we could use something like Voila, uh, which is a, a package developed for for uh, Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab, uh, which can create dashboards. So, so we're working on that. And uh, in the meantime, the main way of using uh, Glue through Jupyter is uh, you have to do a fair number of things programmatically. So, for example, this sets up the application. So um, you can import uh, Glue Jupyter as uh, GJ in this case, and we run this command called JGlue. Um, so that doesn't show anything. It just has instantiated the, the application, uh, and it means that this app object can now be used to interact with the application. So we can do app.loadData, Boston uh, planes six hours, uh, and that basically does the same as if you went to the Qt desktop app and uh, did file open data set. And the reason that's important is because uh, it means that if you've defined any plugins um, that can read custom data, in principle, you should then be able to use these here as well. So any data factory that was defined for the Qt application actually is not Qt specific and it, it would work here too. Um, so the way that you create visualizations is uh, you can do, uh, for example, app.scatter2d, then you give it the name of the attributes you want to use uh, and the data set. Um, so if I do this, 
So I'll get a scatter plot which is empty. The reason why is because the first time it shows um, the OpenGL uh, context hasn't been correctly initialized, so you need to run the cell again. Um, so this is why I meant that there's still a few kind of usability bugs. So if, if you run it and there's no points, just try running the cell again. Uh, you then have uh, the scatter plot. So the, the, the interesting thing about this is that um, basically it's really helped us kind of um, clean up you know, a lot of the glue code which to, to make sure that a lot of the stuff that wasn't uh, specific to certain front ends has been um, kind of modularized. Um, and while working on this, we realized that, well, this uses currently a library called bqplot. Uh, for the scatter plot, so this is bqplot. Uh, if you wanted, you could actually also use matplotlib. So to do that, you would just do widget equals matplotlib. Um, and that's an interesting failure. So um, I think, uh, so I'll, I'll check. I think this must be the latest version of IPy MPL. Anyway, so under other circumstances, you would then see a matplotlib plot. Um, but for now, we'll just stick with the BQ plot one, which looks a bit better. Um, so, um, so then you have the same concept that you have these these options on the right here to, to select what's shown on which axis. So you can also change it, you know, make the same kind of plots as before. Um, you can go to layers and edit the different layers. Um, you can, you know, change the kind of the appearance of of uh, the layers, um, change the color and so on. You can make selections. Uh, so we can go and select some points up here. Um, and then, you know, this now appears as a layer here where you can, you know, change the, the color. Uh, so it's, it's basically very similar to what you would do in the desktop app, just in a Jupyter widget. Uh, we can also make a histogram. So this now shows a histogram with the, the selection I made just now. Uh, and I can go and, um, you know, update the subset, show something else. Um, and then, you know, the, the other plot will update. So you'll see straight away that one of the main issues with using Jupyter Notebooks for this is that it's very difficult to see multiple things at the same time, okay? So you have, you know, if you have five visualizations and you make a selection, it's kind of a pain to go up and down and see other ones. So this is why we want to use uh, Jupyter Lab uh, because Jupyter Lab actually makes it a lot easier to then uh, kind of drag off certain visualizations and uh, and have them kind of in panels uh, to reproduce a little bit what you might get in the Glue desktop application. Uh, but for now, this at least kind of works, um, and so we're working on this, and then we'll work on the the kind of UI a little bit more later. Um, there's also there's a 3D scatter plot, so that one is a little bit slow at the moment, unfortunately. Um, but uh, there you go. So you can, in principle, show um, this is a th an actual 3D distribution, x, y, and altitude. Um, it's using a library called IPy Volume. Um, yep. Yeah, so you get you can make the same kind of plots as before. You can also make selections in this plot as well. Okay, so there's another notebook uh, I'll just show briefly, which uh, because I want to show you the same kind of data that I showed in the desktop application. If you go to astronomy um, and then W5, this will be the other data set I showed before where you have an image and a catalog and you link them. Uh, so I'll show you a little bit how you can link data sets. So again, we can uh, run this to fetch uh, the, the relevant data sets. So the W5 PSC uh, .csv and then w5.fits. Um, we can fetch the, well, sorry, create the, the Jupyter application uh, for glue. Uh, load the data with app.load data. Uh, this is just, you know, we can take a look at the data in the same way that you would in the IPython terminal in glue. Uh, so you can just see all the different attributes and data set. Um, and then um, make a scatter plot viewer. Again, we have to run it a couple of times uh, for it to work. Um, and then, you know, as, as before, you can go and make selections and, and so on. So this is the same data as before. Um, now, I mentioned before that there was the state classes, which you could use to, to change things in plots. It turns out the state classes in the Jupyter version are exactly the same as the state classes in the Qt version of Glue. Um, so you can do the same kind of things. You could do viewer.state.yat to change what's on the y-axis. Um, and so this and then it updates the plots. Um, and then uh, this, this basically you know, will show a histogram of the data. Uh, and then, so more importantly, um, I can now show, because you saw the, the scatter plot before and the histogram, but now we can show also images. 
So again, uh, same kind of options uh, as in the Qt version. Uh, you can change the appearance and the color map and so on. Um, and then if you actually want to set up links, uh, you can use app.addLink and then you just give it one data set, the attribute, and then the other data set and the attribute that you want to link, and you can link those together. Uh, then at the end, what we can do is now take the data, the catalog data, and add it to the image data in the image viewer. And once we do this, you can see the catalog data appears on top of the image. Um, and uh, as before, I can go and you know, make selections in the histogram. There we go. <laughs> and, uh, and that should now appear on top of the image viewer. Okay. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll select a few, maybe a few points. Just to make it a little bit easier to see. Uh, and then you can see those points over here. You can enable or disable uh, data layers as needed. So you can say, I don't want to show the full set of points. Uh, I just want to show you know, the subset of points and so on. Okay. So this is all developed uh, in a, there's a repository in the, so on GitHub we have an, an organization called GlueViz uh, that contains all the repositories for uh, Glue itself. So this, this Glue repository is the core uh, repo uh, for Glue. We also have uh, Glue Jupyter, which is where this work is happening. Uh, all the plugins are also uh, defined here. So if you have issues with any of those plugins and so on, you can open issues on GitHub for those. Um, Yep, and so let's see, is there anything else to mention about this? Yeah, um, so one thing I should say is that, uh, and, and as some of you discovered just now, so some of the plugins are, are very experimental, they're very kind of bare bones at the moment. Um, one thing we're really interested in is finding people who you know are, are experts in certain domains and helping us you know maintain those plugins, uh, you know develop new functionality and so on. And so you know we're very open to to new contributors and and developers. So if you want to get involved, uh, you know we'd love for you to do that. Um, we're happy to give you you know responsibility on on some of the plugin packages. Um, Saturday, uh, I'll be here for the, the hack days after the main conference. Um, and uh, I won't be there Sunday, but I'll be there Saturday. If anyone wants to work on anything glue related, then uh, you're very welcome to, to you know, to like tell me and, and we can come up with a, a project for that. Um, so otherwise for now, what I suggest is, you know, if you want to work a little bit more on this, uh, feel free to try out the, the, you know, the notebooks. Um, if you want to try them out with your own data and the data is not too large, you can actually upload uh, data here. So you can click on upload, um, upload your data to, to this uh, environment here. You'll have access to it from the notebooks. Um, and we'd love to have feedback on, on any of this. Um, otherwise, uh, feel free to continue working on, uh, you know, like the New York taxi data or any other data that, that you have uh, that you're interested in, in looking at and we'll come and look around. Um, just, just one very quick note, uh, which is I forgot to mention that uh, if you, so if you want to, to have any updates about you know, the project when there's new versions released, so Glue Jupyter and, and the plugins and so on, um, there's, uh, again, there's a mailing list. Uh, there's also the Slack team. Um, so I really encourage you to sign up at least to the mailing list. It's a very low traffic mailing list. It has you know, one email a month or so. It's mostly announcements about new versions of other packages and so on. Okay. So, but thank you very much for coming and for your patience uh, you know, and trying out Glue today. So.